So we're going to talk about the materials you're going to use in this class, and I'm just going to go in the order I have them on the materials list in the syllabus. So the first thing is the solvent. This is Gamsol, it's odorless mineral spirits, and it's very slow evaporating, very, uh, it's like, you need something that will be a solvent for oil and be very gentle, and Gamsol is a very gentle, slow evaporating solvent. If you find you're very sensitive to solvents, it is possible to put something like walnut oil in your brush cleaner if you want to eliminate solvents altogether. I have a friend, uh, Steve Orphan, he lives on a boat and he's a great painter and he just uses oil. So it doesn't clean your brush out quite as well. It's very, it, it's very slippery, a little hard to control. I recommend this uh, and this is what I'm using. Then we have our brushes. So. You see, I don't have very many brushes here, and I have this shape of brush, which is a filbert brush. There are brushes that are square as well. So the brushes come in three main shapes. Here's a round, here's a flat, and here's a filbert. I like the filbert shape, the slightly tapered shape, a lot. Uh, these brushes just have, because of their different shape, so a flat brush gives you a stroke that's a little squared off at the end. So maybe that's better for architecture or surface prep. I actually find the filbert shape of brush really useful. You can get pretty fine lines with it and it, it's, it's good for organic shapes, which since I like to paint people and things like that, I find the filbert shape very useful. And a round shape is also very useful. Round shape, probably you want to find one of these for detail, but it's more like a, if you're drawing with a pencil or something, it's almost more like that. You, you want a smaller one for more fine work. So those are the big shapes of brush. The material that they're made with also affects basically how much surface texture shows. So the stiffer your brush bristles, the more texture you'll get. If you want to keep your surface very sort of quiet and controlled, maybe you want softer bristles. These are all synthetic. This is a Utrecht one. It's pretty inexpensive. Um, I find the synthetic works just as well for most things as a, you know, the most expensive brushes are sable. They're a little softer, hold a little bit more liquid, but um, these will save you a lot of money and I'm sure the sables would vote for you to use the synthetics. In terms of the size of brushes that you get, I think you're going to need some maybe small rounds for detail and generally you want to use as large of a brush as you can for the size of brush stroke that you're making. So if you have a large surface to, care, to cover, use the largest brush you can. Sometimes it's even better to use a little bit larger brush than you can control. I had a teacher, Bob Leavers, and he said uh, if things aren't working well, use a bigger brush. Next, we want to clean stuff up. This are, these are shop towels, which are great. Uh, I find them to be the best quality. If you're doing something like rubbing on a painting, they shed the least. Uh, they're really good. Viva paper towels are also very good. Uh, next, we have a palette. So I have here a wooden palette, which I've used a lot. Um, wood's fine, it's inexpensive. Even a piece of scrap wood that's flat would be very inexpensive and be perfect for you to use as a palette. And you can see how I've organized the palette over time and basically scrape it down, it gets a gray tone. The first time you use a palette, you wanna just, the wood will drink up the oil. So when you're done using it, you scrape your paint off, maybe leave a little paint on there and wipe it off with a little bit of your oil. It will get sort of a, sheen over time like this. I also have here a glass palette. I like the glass palette a lot because I can paint the back of it the same color that I have my ground. Then the uh, then the way the paint looks on the palette is going to be a better predictor for the way it looks on the ground. If you have a palette that's white, I find that a tougher palette to work on because everything looks darker on white. So. Just to make my point here, if I start with, say, a gray paint and put it on a white ground, it looks darker than it is. On this gray ground, it kind of vanishes. I actually think that's an advantage for the gray ground, because if I'm painting something on the white ground and I want to have 
say this is a sphere and I want to show that it's partly lit, I have to paint everything around it to get the light to show. And usually I put things that are a little bit lighter than I think they are because the light makes me think that they're darker than they are. If I want to make something light on the gray ground, I can just grab some lighter paint and put it on there and now it's lighter. So the gray ground is much faster. I'll be talking to you more about this later, but I want to talk to you a little bit about it at the outset. So that's why I have this as a gray surface. You're used to seeing them white. And I would recommend if you have a canvas that's white and you're starting, just take a little bit of a color like raw umber or a color that doesn't have any white in it and brush it over your ground a little bit. We'll talk about that more later when we paint, but we can paint on a number of things. And I actually want to talk to you separately about the things that you're painting on. So this is like a stretched, it's actually polyester, but it's very much like stretched canvas. Uh, so that's the palette. Here is a palette knife. I find this shape, this kind of diamond shape to be really effective because you can mix small amounts with it or larger amounts. Um, so when you're getting a palette knife, I think this is a very useful shape. Then I list jars for holding medium and solvent. We'll talk more about mediums later. You can paint with just the Gamsol if you like, that will dilute the paint just fine. These are very useful. They also have a uh, silicoil, which is, uh, I'll show you that. I have a separate video entirely about recycling solvents. If you're working at home, that's something that's gonna come into play. So I'll, I'll send you a link for that, or I already have. These are very good for travel because they seal up better. They're a little more expensive. Um, so this is a little brush cleaner. It's got a little gasket, it has, some little perforations in there, little holes, so that you, basically those holes help you clean out the paint from your brush. Next, we have oil paint in a number of colors. This is the palette for the class, and it's fairly, uh, it's fairly limited, but all very permanent. And I wanna to talk to you in a minute about testing the quality of paint, but first, these are the colors we'll use. Here's a tube of raw umber. I refer to a tube of burnt umber in a second as raw umber. Actually, either one is fine. So if you already have burnt umber, that will work perfectly as well. So we're just gonna go through the colors we're gonna use quickly. Here's a raw umber. Don't worry about the brands for now. I want to talk to you about testing paint and testing. I, I tested a lot of different brands of paint and can give you some tips on a balance of affordability and quality. So this is burnt sienna. And it's PR, sorry, it's PBR7, which is actually important. Um, PR101 sometimes is used in burnt sienna, and it has a yellowish undertone. So this is to balance well with another color. And don't worry about the brand. Just check the label and make sure that it says PBR7 on your burnt sienna. Here is a yellow ochre. And you know, so I'm, I'm have different brands for different colors. Brands of oil paint are all interchangeable. They do vary in quality, but you can use them all together. So use the best paint you can afford to use. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. Here's cadmium red medium. So cadmium red medium is the most like a primary red. So that's why we want to use the medium. It's best for mixing. Here's a cadmium yellow light. I guess this one's called pale, but same principle. Now with cadmiums, you want to be careful because as it goes from pale to medium to dark, it actually gets a little bit redder. So that's why we want to use a very pale cadmium yellow because it's the most useful for mixing. If you're outside and you're trying to mix a very acidic green, like a backlit leaf, and you have a cadmium yellow medium or deep, that reddishness in the cadmium is going to counter the green and you won't be able to get a saturated green. So cadmium is expensive enough that make sure you buy a, a light one. Also watch out for the word hue on paint. That means that they're not giving you the color that they say they are. So on the blue side of the palette, those are all warm colors. These are sort of cool colors now, more bluish. Here's an ultramarine blue. 
very inexpensive a useful color here's a cobalt blue also really useful this is an expensive brand i would say uh blick store brand um m gram and gamblin are all much less expensive good quality brands this is a very uh very much like a primary blue so it's a really useful color for mixing and then white so this is titanium white white comes in different pigments this is the strongest one so i think that's what you should use titanium or titanium zinc is fine and you don't want to use just pure zinc because it's very transparent so if you're wondering why you can't get your lights light enough, if you're using zinc white, that might be one reason. So titanium white's very useful for mixing. Another item on the list is gesso. So gesso is something that we use to prepare a surface for painting on an oil. Gesso is an Italian word for chalk. So the difference between, say, acrylic paint in white and acrylic gesso is that the gesso has some chalk in it some calcium carbonate. So it just makes the surface a little more absorbent, a friendlier surface for the oil to adhere to. Now gesso comes white. There are some gessos that come gray. If you want to buy some gray gesso, that will save you some time. What I tend to do is mix it with a little bit of raw umber acrylic, which I'll show you in a separate video about preparing paper for painting with oil. But uh, gesso is good. And then as we get to surfaces we want to paint on, the supply list mentions stretcher bars which is, are these things that the canvas is stretched on. I'll do a separate video about that. And you can paint, you can gesso a lot of things to paint on. You can gesso paper, you can gesso wood, you can gesso all kinds of panels. So it's sort of up to you. I actually like paper a lot because it's very portable. So let's talk about surfaces to paint on. Uh, one of the most readily available and expensive options is this, which is just a regular cheap canvas panel. Uh, I believe they call it a canvas panel, but it's probably muslin. It's on a piece of cardboard. You want to gesso. You notice that again, I talked about it already, but I have all these surfaces a little bit gray. Again, this is raw umber acrylic mixed with acrylic gesso that I find a really useful ground. So this is pretty ready to go. Uh, you can also gesso wood panel, traditional canvas or linen. These are some different hard panels. This is uh, ABS. It's a plastic you can get on Amazon. It's actually, it's what Legos are made out of. You just sand it a little bit. You could paint on it, and if you like a white ground, you could paint on an oil immediately. I like the gray ground, so I put a little bit of that on. This is dye bond. I will send you a link to video preparing dye bond. It's lightweight. It's actually two very thin pieces of aluminum heat mounted onto this honeycomb core in the middle. They use it for sign painting, so it stays outdoors for years. So it's very permanent stuff. Um, I've been talking about painting on paper. So here's, here's a few paintings on paper. This is um, a hot press smooth watercolor paper. You could do it maybe on Bristol, but the watercolor paper is made to get wet, so it takes it a little bit better. I will show you how to prepare it separately, but I just want to show you if you do want to work on paper, one of the advantages is how much space it saves. So what I have here is a little book. I just decided what size I wanted. This is 10 by 11 because the watercolor sheet comes in 22 by 30. So it just cuts down pretty evenly to this size. And then I just hole punched it with a two hole hole punch from uh, off the supply store and put little ring binders in it, and I made a little book. Now, the advantage of making this little book is that I can put all the paintings from this class that you wanted to do, maybe even two or three times over, in the space of one painting. So I know storage is always a concern, so paper is a very effective way to um, make the best use of the space that you have. So all I did was, once I figured out what size I wanted this, I made a little book by just cutting down a piece of real thin plywood for both sides so I have something to protect it. That way if I want to go out and paint, I can actually uh, even put a wet painting in here with this one extra modification of, I put a little bit of square dowel around here, eighth inch square dowel you can get from 
most art supply stores, most hardware stores. I just glued it around the edge there. What that does is if this surface is wet, it protects the surface from getting damaged. So if you're if you need something you can put away while it's wet, this is a really uh, advantageous way to do it. I can clip it like this and even I could throw it in a backpack, which I've done. So I just want to show you this little book because I think it's a very efficient way to have a lot of paintings in a small space. This covers everything you'll need to get started painting. I'll be posting more detailed information about materials soon uh, and look forward to getting started painting.